Hi, I'm Steve Clements, and I have a question. After the latest scandal at the World Bank, should that institution be trusted? And should its plug be pulled? Let's get to the bottom line. Once upon a time, the World Bank had an annual publication that ranked every country in the world according to the ease of opening and running a business. And it became a hugely successful and influential annual report. Well, now it's dead. The Doing Business Report was supposed to be a useful tool for businesses and investors before jumping into uncharted waters. But as it became more important for governments that wanted to attract foreign direct investment, it also became more crucial to be ranked highly. Plus, there was that prestige element to being ranked highly as an attractive place for business. Then, boom, a recent investigation found that countries such as China, Saudi Arabia, and others were pressuring the bank to increase their scores, while other countries like Chile and Azerbaijan were having their scores pushed down for political reasons. So what does this tell us about the World Bank and its other reports? And if the mighty World Bank is vulnerable to political and financial pressure, what should we say about smaller institutions and governments that are trying to fight corruption? Today, we're talking with Judith Kelly, dean of the Sanford School of Public Policy at Duke University and author of Scorecard Diplomacy, Grading States to Influence Their Reputation and Behavior, and Fabrice Houdar, a former officer at the World Bank and the office of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights and currently the managing director at Out Leadership. Thank you both for joining me today. And let me just start with Judith. Can you help us set the stage for what has happened in terms of the accusations that have flown about the World Bank doing business report? Sure. So uh, the bank started publishing this report you know, in 2004. Uh, it became quite an influential report. Many uh, countries are trying to, to uh, move up in the rankings, as you said. Uh, and over time, uh, countries work with the bank on what sorts of reforms can be undertaken. And the pressure, as you've described, has, has built over the years. And there are some countries that have, have put pressure on the bank. And uh, in 2016 and 2018, there were some, um, uh, some questions raised about certain types of rankings. And last August, uh, it was actually paused. The report was paused so that an investigation could be undertaken uh, about these four countries in particular and their rankings. And now, uh, you know, recently, uh, the investigation came out and the, re the bank reacted very forcefully by actually saying we're going to discontinue the report altogether. So that's the stage. Let me, well, let me ask you, Fabrice. I mean, you worked inside uh, the World Bank. What's wrong with measuring one country versus another? What's wrong with looking at various criteria and trying to establish empirically not only how different countries compare, but what sorts of criteria help a political economy, a liberal market economy move forward. What are the flaws in that in that formula? Well, you know, Steve, uh, of course, Professor Kelly is more the specialist on, uh, on doing business rankings. But what I believe is that it's extremely important for the World Bank to make an assessment of the ease of doing business in countries. And in fact, who else than the World Bank can do it? Hmm. And that's why it's actually extremely unfortunate that the bank had to erase the Doing Business Initiative, which a lot of taxpayer money has been spent to establish because of unethical behavior at the top of the institution, but also because of the fact that the board, which is a 170 million uh, cost every year, did not play its oversight role on issues with senior management. And so, you know, I believe that the bank should continue to measure doing business. But unfortunately, because of this issue, doing business as it exists has to disappear. It should be mentioned that Kristalina Georgieva, who was second in command at the World Bank at the time, now head of the International Monetary Fund, has called the inve investigation simply untrue. Um, how... How much is the pattern that has been written about, not only uh, in those that have been reporting on this case, but, you know, the Washington Post just recently came out and just said this is a big deal uh, in a fully uh, full-fledged editorial critique of the World Bank and said we now have to take the World Bank with a grain of salt as we look at these reports. How much of what we are seeing in the doing business report, Fabrice, do you think has been part of the problem of other work that the World Bank has done? Well, you know, I agree with you. It is a huge deal because 
what it what it questions is the seriousness of key institutions like the World Bank and the IMF. And the truth is that, Steve, you, you might remember the Wolfowitz affair in 2007, uh, in which actually I think you kind of played a, a bit of a role. And, you know, since then, there has been discussion about issues of ethics and retaliation at the World Bank. Mm. And the recent comment that Mr. Malpa, the current president of the bank, said, in which he said, well, we are going to have a hard look at our culture, at our ethics, at our issues of retaliation, that's not enough, because all of his predecessors have made the same proclamation. And so we have to question issues such as, who are the shareholders selecting to be at the helm of those institutions? What is the board doing in terms of oversight? You know, when you have a sitting board, things like that should not be happening. And so I think it's key to remember that this is not only about doing business, it's about the culture of the institution. Hmm. You, did, you recently wrote uh, a, a very fascinating, informative piece on uh, called What Happened at the World Bank's Doing Business Report. And, and to just give your report credit, you know, in terms of responding uh, to the IMF managing director, uh, Madam uh, Georgieva, you said that she thanked the staffer for doing his, quote, bit for multilateralism when the rankings on China were changed. And I'm interested in, you know, your insights into this, because your point is broader than the Doing Business Report. As I understand it, your book, the, the, your studies have shown that these ranking reports always lead to gaming and essentially always lead to cronyism, if I'm getting it right. Um, am I understanding your perspective on this correctly? So uh, you asked earlier uh, what's wrong with ranking countries and, and scoring them in different ways. And so I would say there's absolutely nothing wrong, and it's actually a good idea in many different ways. I should make clear, I personally have made no comments on a, about the misconduct of anybody in the World Bank. I'm not privy to the in, uh, investigation, mm. and I commented on anybody's conduct. Um, but, uh, it, but there are so many different ratings and rankings out there that uh, this is really a phenomenon that's grown over the last 30 years. And, uh, you know, the, the U.S. State Department rates countries on uh, how they perform on human trafficking. We got uh, the, the aid transparency index. I mean, there's so many indices out there. And this is also not the only one the World Bank is doing. And so I think that we have to ask ourselves whether uh, just because something goes wrong in a particular report, is that a reason to get rid of all these types of exercises? You know, there's so much information out there. We can't consume it all. We can't process it all. And that's why we love ratings and rankings, whether it's a U.S. News and World Report rating, you know, universities or, you know, whether it's the bank rating uh, the ease of doing business. And it is a way also for organizations, sometimes weak organizations, to, uh, to help define norms around certain things and to put pressure on countries. And they see results. And so, yes, no, no system is perfect. Uh, and there's a lot to be learned from these types of ratings and ranking systems that can be powerful ways of exercise, uh, exercising influence in, in global governance, more broadly speaking. Well, I mean, I really appreciate that perspective. And let me jump back to Fabrice for a minute and ask, you know, the criteria you're asking about can really matter a lot. And some, some have been critics of this process at, at both of the Bretton Woods institutions, the IMF and World Bank, had said that the, essentially the values that are trying to be generated often work at odds with environmental issues, with labor issues. Uh, Fabrice Houdar works on uh, the broad issues of inclusion and diversity, LGBTQ uh, issues across the world, and that if those aren't somehow looked at, you know, you can go to Michael Porter at Harvard University, said, you want to be a successful, fast-growth city? Those places in the world that are pro-LGBT are the ones that do best, and you can look at the rankings. But that kind of um, uh, comparative scale on labor, environment, and other issues, at least people have crit criticized and said they're not robust enough. That's why... Uh, you had some pressure on countries like Saudi Arabia, for instance. Fabrice, your thoughts? Yeah, you know, I mean, of course, you know, now that I work in the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, um, I believe that the sustainability of economies such as Saudi Arabia or Singapore requires for them to make progress on human rights. And, you know, I was always very upset to see that Singapore was at the top of the chart in doing business despite the fact that it criminalizes same-sex relationship and actually it stifles uh, LGBTQ uh, civil society. 
But one of the things that I that I should mention is that there was progress. And in fact, the Doing Business report, as soon as 2016, started including a very um, prominent gender lens to the doing business. And, and in a way, it, it's kind of sad to see that all this work is now going to go to waste because of misbehavior mm. at the helm of the institution. Fascinating. You so, know, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, so, I mean, it's, what, what you're referring to is the introduction of the women and the law into the East Doing Business rankings, right? And and we saw uh, Saudi Arabia really tumble, for example, when the when women and the law were introduced into these rankings. And this goes precisely to the point that these weightings and rankings are really discussions about values. They're discussion about what what matters. And when we talked about the, you know, the uh, Global Development Index, and then we have the Sustainable Development Index, it's all about what should we be caring about. And so at the end of the day, it comes down to methodology and transparency and accountability, right? And when you have an index, unfortunately, like the Easy Doing Business, that, that uh, tries to put forward a very scientific methodology, then this type of pressures uh, are are much more it's much more susceptible to uh, to to things going wrong because everything is being measured kind of precisely as opposed to a lot of other ratings and rankings that use sort of more broad subjective categories of doing you know these are doing well these are underperforming these are doing great uh, and so I think this question of norms and of transparency and of accountability are really important and I'm not sure that. I'm not sure that the world of the ease of doing business report is going to be going to waste. I do think the bank will be looking at other ways of measuring the business, uh, the business uh, environment. And we also now have women in the law. There's a separate index that measures that. So that's also not going to waste. Judith, uh, let me just take this a step forward uh, further, because you just raised something that I think is at the core of something I've been intrigued with. And that is, I don't know how to put it any other way, a kind of relative process where America's weight in the world continues to be important, but other nations are becoming vastly more important as well on a relative basis over time. And that means that the values and norms in China matter, the values and norms in India matter, or Brazil, or other large you know, stakeholders in the global system. You could even go to countries, as Fabrice talked about, Singapore, very small. They're small nations that really hit above their weight that have big impact. We, we were talking about the UAE, for instance, as one of those that influenced. So I'm interested in the values tension over the donor countries, the donor countries that sort of undergird the support for the uh, Bretton Woods institutions, and to what degree we have a values clash evolving and we have our head in the sand about it. Um, and so your thoughts on that? And I'll go to Fabrice as well. Yeah, so uh, I do think we have a, a values clash, you know, and we see it with the Belt and Road Initiative and other things like this. And I think that, you know, it's very interesting. I studied election monitoring a long time ago, and initially all the election monitoring organizations were very Western-driven. And then um, you started to see uh, some Russian uh, organizations, some Chinese efforts, other efforts to try to present alternative monitoring organizations. And so in the same way in the in the space around ratings and rankings, I suspect that we will see more and more cases where different countries are taking the lead and trying to 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 um, present different values that should matter and rate and rank countries in different ways as a way of, of promoting their value system. Fabrice, your thoughts? Yeah, well, you know, if you read the report, the reason why Jim Kim improved the ranking of China is because he wants China to contribute to the capital increase that the other countries would not contribute substan substantially to. And then similarly, the reason why he improved the ranking of Saudi Arabia is because Saudi Arabia is paying reimbursable technical assistance to the bank. And so one of the, one of the clear signs is that for the European and Western country to disengage financially from this institution, it's leaving room to China and other countries to take their place. And then the other thing that I wanted to point out, Steve, is that I mentioned that the board, the sitting board, didn't play its oversight role. And one of the reasons is because the quality of the executive directors has been declining over time. And the reason why it has been declining is because European countries and Western countries very often do not care about those institutions. And so China is coming in and saying, well, 
if you don't care about this institution, I'm going to uh, fill that vacuum. Okay, you know, one of the other things, Fabrice, um, that you and I have discussed before is that sometimes you have excellent, excellent staff within the uh, system, the bureaucracy of these, uh, the, these institutions, but they're often over on visas that, that make them vulnerable to pressure from management, that they are held hostage, much like we talk about other, uh, in human trafficking, people being held hostage by someone who has essentially uh, impressed them into service and threatening them with uh, uh, being expelled from a country or something over their, their passport. I'm just interested in what the power relationship is between managers who you've just said are largely derelict in their governance responsibilities in some cases versus the staff who are vulnerable in raising or challenging uh, the orthodoxies or the instructions they're getting from managers. Yeah, you know, the vast majority of the staff, 95%, are incredibly dedicated and passionate people about the issue of development and eradicating uh, extreme poverty. And so it's really sad to see that the reputation and credibility of the institution is being tarnished by their senior management. But as you mentioned, you know, it's very difficult to dissent in an institution when you will be quickly expelled from the United States if you dare to criticize uh, the organization because of your visa status. And then there is another element which is crucial, Steve, is that the vast majority of the people that work on the Doing Business report were short-term contractors, meaning people that were not certain they would have a contract in the next six months, and therefore they also could not express dissent. When you read the Wilmer Hill report, it's atrocious to see the threat of retaliation that are clearly made by the staff of uh, Mrs. Georgievia and the staff of President Kim against anybody that would dare talk about the change in the ratings. Judith, let me ask you uh, a similar question, because I think your critique has gone more to the core of these ranking reports. And my question is to you is, 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 because you also said a few moments ago, they don't necessarily have to be this way, that other things could be good. Is there some way to manage or organize a report that would be resilient against these kind of pressures that have been uh, outed and discussed? Is there some formulation that you proposed that would get um, these kind of comparisons, which Fabrice said they're going to happen again, they can play a useful role, but, but you said fundamentally they become corrupt just about every time. Well, I mean, the bank, of course, did try to have a firewall. I know many of the excellent people who worked on producing the report, and uh, there, there, there were definitely uh, supposed to be firewalls. So that's one way of trying to, to do it. But the pressures, you know, we're talking here about countries like China and Russia. The pressures are immense. Uh, it's not the first time they've tried to uh, put pressure on the whether or not there even should be a ranking. Like seven or eight years ago, they were trying to just say, yeah, you can have the data, but don't rank, and, you know. So there's a, this is immense pressure. You know, other ways is to have these things done by organizations that are not themselves these powerful uh, organizations uh, that have these member states per se. So, you know, with, there's something, there's a small uh, NGO called Publish What You Fund that has something called the A Transparency Report. And they rank the transparency of how uh, all the big uh, aid agencies of the United States and UK and all, all over the world are how transparent they are with their spending. And you know it's a very powerful uh, a tool, but it's 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 uh, separate because it's a small NGO doing it. But you know, nothing is ever going to be perfect. Uh, and so I think at the end of the day we have to say, are these ratings and rankings worth it? And then when something com comes out, you know, can you find ways to address it and improve it? Certainly, the United States. Uh, 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 trafficking in, in, in persons report has had political pressures in the past, but it's it's still going strong, and it's important because there are, there are, it's difficult to exert pressure on countries. It's difficult to get about the types of reforms in human rights and other areas. And if there are ways of saying this country, you know, is treating women better, uh, this country has a, a greater percentage of women in parliament, etc., these are soft tools that allow us to get a long way. And so I just really hope that we won't throw the baby out with the with the bathwater and that we take a good look. Uh, the Easy Doing Business report has done a lot of good work, but maybe it is an opportunity now to look. Uh, some of the, 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 uh, 
the things that were being measured by the bank, you know, very deregulatory in nature, and many people think that's the way to go. But deregulatory pressures also has effects on on labor rights, for example, on environmental issues. So maybe we can take a step back and uh, and come to an even better uh, solution now. And it's fascinating. You know, I, I I I feel like this discussion is one we should have been having years ago uh, in this way to kind of look at these questions. And and I guess you know one of the points of introspection and perhaps humility that I think of as an American, America that has been sprawling the world trying to tell other countries, you know, how to organize, that after the 2008, 2009 financial crisis, I think there are real questions on America's, you know, uh, uh, qualifications to counsel about crony capitalism. I think after January 6th, the insurrection in the U.S. Capitol. It's harder for Americans to talk about how to manage democracy right. What should be uh, the rights of various parties within a, within a system? We're not, we're not showing it. That's the U.S. side of this equation. And I'd just like to ask you, Fabrice, you know, in, in, in closing, you know, what should our North Star be? Should we have a kind of a la carteism like uh, you did just sort of describe that we're no longer looking at any political system per se as the model, and we need to have an a la carte selection across the board that's constantly compared. Is that the honest way to do this? Well, you know, I think a, a multilateral approach that is completely impartial is necessary, right? Because, you know, this time it was China and Saudi Arabia applying pressure, but you could imagine the United States doing the exact same thing. Hmm. And therefore, it is important that those institutions remain impartial, that they, that, they, that they foster debate, but also that the board play its multilateral role of all the countries coming together at the table and agreeing on the rules of the games. And, um, and therefore, I think, you know, to me, it, it, you know, it's important to realize that this is not the end of the World Bank or the IMF, that data remains credible, but that we probably have to have a hard look at the culture of the institution, who, are, who do we appoint at the head of the institution, and perhaps more importantly, is the sitting board playing its oversight role? Judith, and let me... Just coming, yeah, please go ahead, Judith. If I may, I mean, the ease of doing business is not the only one out there. I mean, it is, there is a free-for-all out there. There are many producers of different rank, uh, rankings in this space. There's the Global Competitiveness Index, the Heritage Foundation has an index of economic freedom. Right. There's a global entrepreneurship monitor. I mean, there's many different ones out there. And so cultivating a broad universe of different types of measurements, I think, is beneficial. Well, thank you for that. Well, we'll leave it there for now, but it sounds like we've got more work to do on, on many of these lists. Judith Kelly, professor at Duke University, and Fabrice Houdar, former officer at the World Bank and the United Nations, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for having us. So what's the bottom line? A lot of people think this World Bank scandal is bad news for globalization. Why should governments do the hard work of weeding out corruption and creating economically efficient and fair systems if there's an easier way to look pretty to other countries and big financial powerhouses? The answer really is that governments aren't that stupid. They always knew that the numbers were prone to manipulation, even if they loved to be in the top 10 or the top 20. The real problems here are hypocrisy and credibility. The World Bank is a powerful Washington-based institution that influences the movement of billions of dollars and constantly counsels other countries on how to properly sculpt their economies and societies. But if the World Bank is vulnerable to crony capitalism, then so too are much smaller institutions and countries. And that's the bottom line.